What makes an arc great? Yeah, I know. It's a really subjective question. Different story beats just work for different people, but at the same time, there are many arcs that are universally considered to be, well, great. What are some of the constants that go into arcs regarded that way, though? Well, that's why I'm here. I'm gonna try my best to cover some of those general constants and also try to dissect why certain story arcs are just so interesting to witness. Since I want to get straight into it, I'm gonna give my spoiler warning. So I'm gonna be talking about three different arcs from three different series. There's the murder solution arc from Beastars, so spoilers for everything past chapter 50, which is basically the exact start of Beastars season 2. And then there's also Arlong Park from One Piece, so spoilers for chapter 69 and on, and then York New from Hunter x Hunter, so spoilers for chapter 64 and on. So with all of that out of the way, what makes an arc great? Since I got my spoilers out of the way, I could say this now. Welcome to part 3 of my Murder Solution series. Wait. Huh? Says the new people that might have clicked on this video because of One Piece or Hunter x Hunter. Don't worry, even though this is part 3 of an ongoing series about the analysis of a Beastars arc on my channel, each part is standalone, so you don't have to go back and watch the other parts to understand this video. But, I mean, you can if you like. Uh, something I don't think I've ever said on this channel. Probably. I don't think I've ever said subscribe. It just feels too, I guess, cliche to do it, but, uh, sub, 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 so anyway, why these three arcs in specific? Like, One Piece and Hunter x Hunter both have arcs that are considered to be better than these. Does Beastars have that? Bro, I fucking wish. Boda Boda, Paru's new manga series, it looks so promising, and that's pretty cool. Anyway, it's because these three arcs all have one thing in common. They are each the first arcs in their respective series that defined and displayed what each series was capable of in their storytelling, characterization, and hard-ass hitting moments. Oh my god. What the fuck? So I'm gonna be breaking this video up into four sections. The setting, the emotional connection, new and or expanded characterization, and the fleshing out of antagonists. But to start out first, let me delve a little more into the three pieces I'm gonna be talking about. The first 50 chapters of Beastars was cool and all, but I'm gonna be honest, the change in the series focus that we saw within the Murder Solution arc was really interesting to read. In my opinion, Lugosi's character was at its absolute peak in this arc, with it highlighting that he really isn't the best person at times. Lugosi forces his morals on everyone else around him. He's very arrogant about it, but he's also really lucky that his morals just happen to be in the good, and a lot more in the good than, uh, <laughs> Riz. Now, Arlong Park. So many people I've talked to say that the Baratier is where the series gets good. Read the Baratier, and that will truly tell you if One Piece is a series that you'll jive with or not. No, it won't. Now look, I promise, don't worry, I'm not shitting on the Baratier. It had a lot of good moments, but like, it was still kind of just the formula of Straw Hats go somewhere, they chill for a bit, villain, Luffy goes go go no, boom, we're done. I was just kind of like, oh... Maybe I guess One Piece isn't my thing. But my friends kept imploring me to read further. And then directly after the Baratier, Arlong Park started. This. This is the arc that should help you decide if One Piece is your thing or not. This arc was really good. Nami's backstory was extremely relevant to the plot of the arc, and that made the stakes the highest they've ever been. As of me writing this video, I'm currently at the beginning of Dress Rosa, and <laughs> yeah, I'm very glad I stuck with the series if you can't tell already. As for York New, I mean, well, people were telling me that Hunter x Hunter was gonna get dark, and I knew that it was gonna be at the Chimera Ant arc, but they meant this too. Oh my god, they meant this too. This was the first First extremely serious arc in the series that Karapika, one of the main characters, has been building up since the very beginning of the story. The antagonists are interesting, Karapika is a fucking badass, and uh, Yusoka. Anyway, let's start out with the first section. When writing a story, the first thing you should do is come up with the characters, and then the setting second. Your characters should be good enough to work in any setting, so that's why the setting is normally not recommended to start with unless you plan to make that one setting the basis of the entire series. So that begs the question, why am I talking about setting first before I talk about the characterization? Well, it's because this section of the video is smaller than the other ones because it doesn't have a dub scene in it, so I want to get this out of the way first. So out of the three, which am I going to pull from for an example of this? Well, Kokoyashi Village is out because it's just one of the generic island designs like the rest of East Blue. And York New is kind of just a city, so we'll cover the Back Alley Market. The Back Alley Market is such a great example of a setting that... Ugh, 
I really feel like this term is extremely overused, but it really does apply to this, is a part of a living, breathing world. So the first two arcs of Beastars, the Play Arc and the Meteor Festival Arc, we mostly spend them at Sheridan, with only some small sections in the Back Alley Market. The Murder Solution Arc takes a shift into fleshing out the Back Alley Market and giving it more depth. Here's why the existence of this place works so well. So I mean, I always wondered why this place was never taken down or even explored by the police, even though it existed for decades. Sure, it technically doesn't break any laws because the meat is from already dead animals, but like the police should be aware that this place is a breeding ground for meat addicts, but then it hit me. While admittingly having to use at least a bit of suspension of disbelief, it works so well to the overall conflict of this world that the police neglect this place. So we hear so much about how terrible and unruly this place is, but then in the murder solution arc, while it still shows many terrible things happening there, Paru tries to flesh out the market by humanizing its residents. We learn that some of the carnivores that live there are only there because they've been cast out by the herbivore-dominated society that doesn't even give carnivores a chance. The back alley market is the physical representation of this side of carnivores that herbivores want to neglect and pretend doesn't exist. Carnivores have predatory instincts and that is something that they could never get rid of. Sure, the back alley market is still a very bad place, but it's a part of life, and choosing to give it more depth and more humanized traits, it is able to perfectly reflect back to how carnivores are in the story. They do have their bad sides, but that doesn't mean that they're constantly trying to keep themselves in check. They want to be good people, and so many of them are. Now look, when writing a story, not all settings have to be as metaphoric as the back alley market is, but this place is really just a great example on how to reflect the plot and characters within a setting. <sighs> Too bad Paru decided to screw all that up. Tearing down the back alley market was such a stupid idea because Paru, you said yourself that carnivores will never truly be able to get rid of their instincts, and in this ending, tearing it down is just another form of denying it, and it does not work. Sorry, this ending just hurts so much. But seriously, when building a metaphoric setting, the murder solution arc's depiction of the physical manifestation of the psyche shadow, aka the part of us that we don't want to acknowledge, is just a great way to do so. In the end, having a compelling setting can be a great foundation for conflict for the characters within the plot. So with setting done, it's time to move on to... So what exactly do I mean by emotional connection? Well, when we care about a character, their wants, desires, hates, rivalries become our own in a sense. We willingly want to see these characters that we've grown so attached to succeed, and whatever hardships they go through, they impact us too, and we feel them with the character. So yeah, I'm just saying that some of my favorite arcs and series that I've read are about an aspect of a pre-established character getting fleshed out to the point that the whole arc is a payoff to it. In this regard, all three of these arcs have that, uh, to varying degrees. The murder solution arc finally delves more into Tem's murder, a plot thread that has been left open since the beginning of the series. Except Tem isn't really the point of that arc though, it's more about Lugosi trying to enforce his morals on Riz. For that reason, I'm going to cover Karapika's massacred clan and Belmare for this section. So ever since the beginning of Hunter x Hunter, we've known what Karapika's one true goal is. Kill the spiders, avenge the Kurta clan, and get their eyes back. Okay, that's actually like two and a half in one, but you get the picture. We've known from the very beginning that the spiders are fucking terrible, and throughout the story, we hear all about those wicked deeds that they've committed. There is so much goddamn build up to when we eventually encounter them, but... What exactly drives our emotional connection to want to see them get destroyed so badly? Well, we spend a pretty good amount of time getting to know Karapika, and I feel that there are a lot of moments for him that really make us care about him and his story. There's a moment during the Hunter exam arc when a prisoner claims to be part of the spiders, and we get to see Karapika's unfiltered rage that he feels when he meets this prisoner. This scene right here truly presents just how much the spiders affect him emotionally. We care about Karapika, and we don't want to see him this distressed and rage-filled, and I feel like this is the scene that emotionally connects us with Karapika, and his goal to annihilate the spiders and avenge his fallen brethren. That is why when we finally face the spiders in the York New City arc, god does that build up pay off so damn well. We're so pumped just to finally see Karapika go up against the group that he's been pursuing since the beginning of the story. And because we took the time to get to know and care about Karapika, our want to see him succeed becomes even stronger, which results in high stakes. But thinking about that though, aren't all high stakes really just built upon emotional connection with characters? Like sure, the world could be ending, but the thing is, it will 
will matter so much more if we really got to know that world. You know what I mean? Continuing on about how emotional connections build high stakes, let's talk about Nami's story. By the end of the Arlong Park arc, which is Nami's story, Arlong is a character we want to see get beaten the fuck out of so badly. Why though? What makes the stakes so high about the fight against Arlong? Well, that brings me to something that Oda is phenomenal at flashbacks. So up until Arlong Park, the backstories of each of the Straw Hats, while being very interesting, never really had much to do with the overall conflict of the arc that they were being shown in. Sure, the Baratier kinda did step it up by showing why Sanji cares about Zeph so much, but overall the flashback was not really related to the overall conflict of the arc that it was being shown in. But then Arlong Park happened. Oh my god, there's a strong reason why Arlong is considered to be one of the poster boy antagonists of One Piece. So at this point, we've had a good 50 or so chapters to create somewhat of a connection with Nami. She was sly, fun, and all around really interesting, but there was always something about her that seemed like she was hiding something. Now when we get to Arlong Park, we learn a bit about her past with a pirate named Arlong. This is where we finally see Nami's backstory, and you know what? I'm just gonna show it to you, and it will all make sense why the stakes are so high. Even if it's just mere words, I still want to be called as their mother. Those girls are my children, aren't they? <laughs> you have children? Belair! No, girls! I, I wish I was adopted by a rich family. I was lying! Belair! Nami! Nojiko! Ow. <laughs> I really wanted to buy you girls a lot of things, whether it be new books or new clothes. Forgive me. We're not being able to do anything motherly for you girls. I still have to show you the map of the world, Ultra! Are these kids your daughters? Yes, that's right. Please don't die, Belmere! So don't lay a finger on them, you hear? Of course. That is, as long as you die quietly. Somebody, please help! Oh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Pathetic primates. Deal with them appropriately, but don't kill them. Got it. You'll be my first example to the others. Die for your stupid love. Hmm. Nojiko. Nami. I love you. Yeah. Fuck. If you didn't already feel emotionally connected to Nami before, here's where her story will hook you. This flashback serves as a build-up to the Straw Hats' fight against Arlong. We now know the awful things that Arlong has done and how they have seriously affected a character that we care a lot about. This is it. This is how you properly build up a climax. Not only are we anticipating the payoff of Nami's backstory, we're now goddamn fucking cheering for it. This is why emotional connection is such a huge factor in making an art compelling. You need proper build up in order to execute plot points with an emotional impact. When stories don't take the time to create proper buildup, they just honestly feel very lackluster. Paru, why? Your first 158 chapters were amazing. So that's why when looking at how to create proper buildup, you should look to Arlong Park. If we didn't see Nami's heartbreaking backstory or her breakdown after years of suffering, the stakes of fighting Arlong wouldn't have been nearly that high. That is why emotional connection is so important for a story. It makes you feel the emotions that the characters are feeling and immerses you so much more into the narrative. So now that I've covered that, let's move on to... So with enough buildup of knowing a character, when a character's full personality is expanded upon within an arc, it's just so satisfying to see. I'm just going to get straight into this section of the video because I have so much to say. Lagosi, Karapika, and Nami all take what we previously known about their characters and they get heavily expanded upon within these three arcs. I'll start out with Lagosi in the Murder Solution arc first. To me, Murder Solution Lagosi and on is Lugosi. In the first two arcs, he was just this awkward guy who kept to himself and less provoked. Well, at the end of the second arc, he was provoked right out of his shell, and that gives us a Lugosi that we have in the Murder Solution arc. Since he was literally able to take down a Mafia, he has some more confidence, and even though he's still pretty awkward, he's not the type of awkward where he's just super frigid about it. It's more like he says a bunch of out there shit and just doesn't give a fuck about it, and I love that. 
this arc mainly focuses on expanding Lugosi's more arrogant side that he's displayed quite a bit throughout the previous arcs. Lugosi is now a lot more persistent when it comes to enforcing his morals, and I find it so interesting to see Lugosi, who is a lot more forward about his emotions with other people than before. If he wants someone to know how he feels about them, he just outright says it to them now. Even if it seems like he's just spouting a bunch of random nonsense in the perspective of other people, as long as he gets them to at least somewhat abide by his moral code, he doesn't care about how crazy he comes off. Each mangaka has their strong suit. Oda's is world building, and Paru's is certainly her characterization. She was able to expand Lugosi's character so well within the murder solution arc because she kept in mind the previous things she built up with him in the previous two arcs. There's just one thing though. Lugosi didn't start acting like this because of the environment and circumstances of the murder solution arc specifically. His personality and character just happened to be like this at this point in the story. So now that brings me to Karapika and York New. Karapika here is so fucking interesting to watch. You know how I mentioned in the last section that we got to see a glimpse at his unfiltered rage against the spiders? Imagine Karapika in that one scene, but now he's like that for an entire arc. Oh my god, this was built up so well. Because the situation of the arc was dealing with the spiders, Togashi was able to take this small trait that was shown off briefly with Karapika and expand that to create a whole other part of this character that he's been hiding from us for so long. Karapika is great at keeping his composure, but when he's pissed off, oh boy. Your physical strength against my reinforced fist. It seems my force is beyond yours. That's precious information. If I could hold them with my chain, I'll be able to strike down every member of the spiders with only my hands. Tell me all you know. <laughs> <laughs> Where are your companions? Die. <laughs> <laughs> what Nen types do the others use? <laughs> Die. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm sick of you. The sensation staying on my hand. Sounds coming to my ears. Smell of your blood. All that's getting on my nerves. Why can't you think of anything? Why don't you feel anything? Is that only possible? Answer me! Karapika's rage against Uvogin, a member of the Spiders, is a great payoff for Karapika's built-up character. This is why characters should be considered before setting, because different settings can trigger different aspects of different characters. The setting of York New and the attack of the Spiders was the stimulus that brought about this side of Karapika's character that was entertaining and gripping to watch the whole way through. Along with the setting and situation of an arc expanding upon a character trait only previously shown a handful of times, Nami in the Arlong Park arc. So pre-Arlong Park Nami was very open about her not really caring about the rest of the crew, but that's just it. She wasn't a straw hat, she just happened to tag along with the crew so she could secretly double cross them, although there were a couple hints that showed that she secretly very much cared about the crew. Halfway through the Baratier when she steals the Going Mary, she starts crying and feels so much remorse for double crossing the straw hats. Arlong Park expands upon that trade and shows us a whole new side of Nami's character. She's only trying to double cross the Straw Hat so she can get enough money to buy her village back from Arlong and free everyone within it. Just knowing that makes us aware of the other side of Nami's character, but that doesn't quite show us it. Well, until... Then that means there's no need for us to rush, because he's looking for me too. Zoro's looking for Arlong? What's he planning? He shouldn't have any reason to fight Arlong. If I let things get any more out of hand than this, then I'll really be in trouble. You're a nuisance. It's your own fault for going against Arlong. Huh? It's my fault that I let you guys follow me this far, but there are certain rules on this island that you're all ignorant of. Everything was going without a hitch until you guys got here. I can't let you ruin the business I've been planning for the past eight years. That's why the least I can do is kill you with my own hands. It'd be best for your own safety to not think of me as me anymore. Now's my chance. If I stayed here any longer, I would have been killed for sure. Certain kill? Smoke star! I thought you might try something like that. Huh? How typical. <laughs> Wait! She didn't kill Usopp, don't worry. She just stabbed her hand to make it look like she did. 
If Nami didn't make it look like she killed Usopp, then Arlong would have killed him for real. This scene right here is the true Nami that the setting and situation of this arc has brought out within her. Up to this point, we've only really seen a silly and slightly shallow version of Nami, with only slight hints to the real her. This scene puts on full display that the real Nami is extremely selfless. It makes it believable that she's living her life to ensure the freedom of so many people. She is sacrificing her dignity and her happiness for the people that she cares so much about. Her stabbing her own hand to save Usopp was a small but extremely effective example at showing the real Nami and her true nature of being so selfless. What I'm trying to get at with this section is that the situation and setting of an arc can really bring about a whole other side of a character that they had previously only shown glimpses of in the past. Sure, Lugosi didn't quite follow this pattern because the murder solution arc didn't bring about his expanded characterization, his previous situations did, but this does heavily apply to Karapika and Nami. It is always very interesting when an arc can expand on a pre-existing character in a way that makes sense to that character. With the correct build-up and execution, the exploration of a pre-established character could be one of the top reasons why certain arcs are so great. So on to the last section. Ah yes, the antagonist. Something very important when building a story. The antagonist doesn't even have to be a person, they could be a place or an underlying force. But for these three arcs, it's a person, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. So as much as the defeat of Arlong is hyped up, if I'm going to be honest, Arlong himself really doesn't have that much depth. I mean, he does when we learn his backstory, and I want to include that, but unfortunately, that is shown 500 chapters later during the Fishman Island arc, and so it's not part of Arlong Park, so I can't talk about it in this video. That leads me to Krollo. We still really don't know much about him, but what we do know is pretty interesting. He's not what you would expect him to be. He runs the Phantom Troop, aka the Spiders, and they have a rule where if one of their members dies, then their murderer could take that member's place. With a rule like that, you'd expect him to see all of his members as expendable, but no, it's quite the opposite actually. When Karapika kills Uvogin, Krolo has a whole ass moment mourning him. A pretty violent mourning, I'll say that. Honestly, I was not expecting that of a character like him. Knowing that there are more human sides to an antagonist really makes you care even more about the conflict because now you not only know the insight of the protagonist, but the opposing force too. It adds complexity to the narrative and in some cases could really make you question if the heroes are in the right. But I mean no, obviously Krollo is not in the right. But what he does do is that he puts the question in Karapika's head if revenge is really the best course of action to take in order to avenge his clan. He creates some real really good extra conflict for Karapika's character, and that's something I really like. Anyway, on to Riz. Riz is really damn interesting because of how we follow his journey as a character. He's not inherently evil, it's more like he's extremely unstable and ended up committing murder, and his mind tries to cope with this by somehow justifying that what he did was right. But in the process of trying to mentally justify his murder to himself, he begins to slowly go insane and believe that the wrong things are correct. Oh, damn. I'm running out of strength restrainers. I can give you some of mine. I've already got some with me. Strength restrainers. They're pills that decrease muscle mass. Bears over two meters tall are required to take these pills once every night. You keep those pills on you, Riz? Mm, that's impressive. Well, of course I do. You know what would happen if I skipped a day without taking a pill? I'd be able to tear off herbivore skin like tissue paper. If we ever neglect our pills, we could find ourselves swimming in a sea of blood. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I know, but... We need to stay aware of our monster strength, <laughs> us bears. What's interesting here is that unlike Krollo and Arlong, Riz is not the one inciting conflict onto the protagonist. It is Lugosi actively creating conflict for Riz that causes Riz to react in strong ways, and we get to see that on full display. You and I are going to have the fiercest friendship the world has ever seen. I wonder what a friendship with you would taste like, Lugosi Kun. No, I'm not saying that we have to sympathize with Riz, but what I am saying is that I am so glad that he is simply not the antagonist just because he's evil or whatever. We get to see his mental state and why he does the things that he does. It all goes together in making a fleshed out antagonist. 
Antagonists don't have to be redeemable. They're allowed to do awful stuff, but those actions only become interesting when there is more to the character than just that bad stuff. Whether it be giving the antagonist slightly humanized traits or showing why they do the things that they do can really go the extra mile in creating an interesting antagonist that helps make up a great arc. To wrap up, everything I talked about aren't the only things that go into making great arcs. There are so many different components that go into so many different styles of arcs that work for different people. I honestly just talked about some of the things that I personally like seeing in arcs. I want to hear what you guys think makes an arc great. Let's discuss it in the comments. With the right setting, emotional connection, expanded characterization, and fleshing out of antagonists, you could really make yourself an enticing arc. This has been part three of the Murder Solution series. See you at part four with the Riz video, and maybe a Pedro video once I get to whole cake, I don't know. <laughs> So I wanted to say thank you to all the voice actors who voiced in this video. You guys all did amazing, and it was so much fun recording with you guys. Also, thank you to Joseph for being a great co-director, and Jack for helping me cast the Hunter Hunter characters for any future Hunter Hunter video I might make. Also, thank you to Carrot Juice for not only voicing Nojiko, but for also drawing the thumbnail of this video. Their art is amazing, and you should so check out their Twitter. Now for two more shoutouts. Blythe. I talked about him in the Goheen video, he's one of the most talented actors I've ever met in my life. Go check him out. Also, Nemesis Productions. He's just starting out in voice acting and really wants to get his name out there, so you should check him out. Anyway, personal plug time. Follow my Twitter and join my Discord server. As always, here are my patrons. You guys are so amazing and you keep this channel going. Thank you so much. So. What's next? I know I said the Riz video, but quick thing, I might have a small Revali video in the works that might release around New Year's, but also, I really just want to shift all of my focus this winter break to finishing Beast Complex the movie. It's looking to be around an hour long, and it's going to be really, really fun. We're dubbing all seven chapters of Beast Complex. It's going to premiere sometime on Tuesday, January 19th, 2021, less than a month away. I'm going to be hosting a release party for it on my Discord server, so you should join. Anyway, see you guys at the Revali video and or Beast Complex the movie.